welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, we got invited to uh, give our insights and bits and pieces. You, you first of all, you think, well, it's pretty rich. These um, bankers standing up here talking about debt and sustainability. Um, we got. I've only got three slides. Uh, first, the second thing I'd probably say is um, I want to thank the organisers. You know, there's definitely been a necessity for a refocus, you know, in, in, in the business. Uh, and you know, so ANZ were you know, very happy to be able to be a part of the, this, this concept, and I think uh, we'd be definitely happy to be uh, part of uh, Mike Murphy's style study tour uh, to Ireland in a couple of years too. <laughs> So, three slides. First slide, dairy debt doubles, uh, debt servicing stable. So, I guess one of the questions is, you know, sort of how did we get here? And I've been involved, I guess, in banking for 20 years. I did also start out in Taranaki. Uh, what you'd probably take out of this slide is that, you know, 20 years ago, near enough, debt was roughly $20, uh, sorry, $10 or less debt per kilogram milk solid and interest rates were 10%. So single digit debt metrics, double digit interest costs. Today we've got double digit KG milk solids of debt and single digit interest rates. So I guess the question is, uh, you know, so how did this happen? If you go back 20 years, every time somebody was uh, requesting funding for a loan, it would be pretty much, uh, uh, the, the, the test really was on the basis that the debt was really paying back over 15 years on a table mortgage. Then we moved probably more towards 20 years on a table mortgage. And some of this demand obviously marries up to what was happening offshore, huge demand uh, for our milk produce product out of places like China. So, very strong correlation between that demand and the demand for capital. So we move from the 20 year pay the debt back to interest only. And obviously with interest only it brings disciplines. Whilst it was interest only, some people still paid their debt back and some people didn't. And we probably, reluctantly, would probably admit there was times when people would bring it in, it might not have been much more than break even, and we probably still have it anyway. Um, so what that tells us is that we helped uh, get here and we're in this together and so now we've got what we've got, we need to understand what are we going to do to make this industry stronger. One of the uh, reasons for this though, of course, you know, things such as events such as the GFC, and it changed uh, the likes of the Reserve Bank and all the international regulators approach to how they looked at banking. And particularly, they wanted uh, to look at how stable these basic banking platforms are because obviously banking is critical to the stability of the economy. So what they would look at when they think about stability, they'd be looking at things like what is happening around the asset prices, what is happening around the volatility and commodity prices, and how are we exposed from an interest rate risk. You know, one of the things, if you're in New Zealand, you know, really we are like a cork at the bottom of the ocean, bobbling around, and we have historically required huge amounts of offshore capital to be able to fund our uh, ideas, to fund our growth. Now, some of the things that the bank has done over time has changed that and made sure that banks in New Zealand are far more funded by their own New Zealand resources, so uh, New Zealand deposits. So one key concept to remember is we can only really grow in New Zealand now as fast as we can save as New Zealanders. So, land value, I think, has uh, been covered off. Uh, and our concern there would be, you know, we're not really into predicting uh, land values and all those sort of things, but I think what we are is seeing a much stronger correlation between yield uh, and what people can return on land uh, rather than, you know, um, obtaining land and, and expecting some sort of uh, you know, level of capital um, appreciation. I guess the thing is, if I look at it, if you go back 20 years, when people look for a loan, the milk prices we were working out then were roughly $3.80. Uh, um, so if you're in Taranaki Farm, $3.80, you know, let's just say that was an all-in per kg milk solid, so that's, uh, there was no separate dividend, and that was including stock sales. And costs back then were about a buck eighty. So $2 a kg milk solid. The interesting fact is today, if you look at a lot of this data, is if you go forward 20 years, 
They're all in per kg milk solid, so milk price, dividend, stock sales is somewhere a bit over six bucks. And uh, these costs, as you're seeing, are somewhere a bit around four bucks, a bit over four bucks in many cases. So for all that growth, we're still sitting roughly at two bucks uh, operating profit or, or even. And if you look at debt, debt was probably a dollar uh, at 10 bucks a kilo back then, at 10%, it's a dollar a kg milk solid. But today, call it $20 at um, 5%, you're a dollar. So, you know, what we can clearly see is that uh, we are uh, very much uh, dependent on what's happening around interest rate for some of our business um, profitability and survival. Uh, we did this session on Monday, and one thing um, that came out of it was a little bit of discussion around sort of you know, how do banks uh, approach uh, things such as uh, funding decisions and, and cost of capital, what have you. Now, I've labelled this um, customer risk profiles. In other words, every single customer, all of us, uh, effectively have some sort of um, characterised risk grading by a bank. Now, I'm not going to give you the long-winded academic discussion about how we necessarily do all this. Suffice to say that you can see that that graph is exponential, which in other words means, a bit like the Richter scale, every time that you lift your risk, it's an exponential lift in the capital that we have to hold. And this capital that the bank has to hold, I don't know that we either explain it well or it's well understood, but if, like you people, banks have balance sheets. Ironically, uh, our assets are your debts, as long as they're able to be serviced. Um, and our liabilities are uh, essentially the deposit holders um, and, and our own capital. And the Reserve Bank and the regulator expects us to hold our own capital, and as they have determined that all banks in New Zealand, because of cork at the bottom of the ocean, we not only have to be uh, just okay or acceptably strong in terms of what the rest of the banks in the world are doing, we have to be unquestionably strong, uh, as we are so reliant upon um, you know capital, uh, uh, sorry, and particularly uh, yes, capital to lend. So. I guess, you know, um, the way to look at this is simply think about stronger ratings, weaker ratings, uh, and increasing capital. So in other words, if we were thinking about approaching a risk grading to a client, a big thing we're really thinking about, we always just say, you know, people or personal factor, but, you know, I think a lot of it's really around conduct. So it's how people set themselves up around their business planning, their strategic plans, have they got milestones that they're wanting to achieve, if they've taken a period of risk, are they taking that risk and paying that risk down? If we look at viability, think about viability in terms of really earnings stability. If we think about earnings stability, it's not I am profitable at seven dollars and four and a half percent interest rate. It's that over time and through different cycles and stress testing it, the earnings on this are still uh, able, uh, stable enough that they can support the level of capital required or, or debt. And if you think security ratio, we sometimes call this LVRs, these three liquid acronyms, uh, there's a very, very strong correlation between uh, what our clients' LVRs are and um, what uh, might happen to their uh, financial stability. Now what this means is, as you, as you uh, borrow funds, it sort of uh, determines then your flexibility of terms. So you can all you can think about stronger ratings, not as stronger ratings and weaker ratings. You can simply think about this as flexibility, i.e., if you're very strong, you have high flexibility. If your business is along the weaker end of the curve, your flexibility is likely to be reduced. In other words, uh, the controls that you might need to put in your business or we might uh, want to have in the business um, are going to be strong. One of the things there I've said there is there is a tipping point. I guess it's like this, right? If we get businesses that have really problematic viability and uh, and you know, debt equity uh, ratios, uh, it actually gets to a point where we cannot price the business to get our accepted return. So uh, what ends up happening is, you know, as a bank, you're concerned about the reputation, uh, obviously that you that you you know, face. You're concerned about uh, the people. So it's one thing to say we price the risk, but if, as you price the risk at the really risky end of the curve, 
actually what we know is we're, we're stuck. So actually there's so much work done more today than probably ever around how we do not get ourselves in that position. So people will often say to me, well, you know, have you got money? Yes. Uh, if you think about it, in the last 20 years, the bank's gone from, uh, our bank's gone from 4 billion into agri to 18 billion. So uh, they've had lots of money. The ag industry's gone from 3 billion in dairy to was it 40 billion, I think, over the last 20 years. So there's been money. <laughs> Uh, the question is really, um, you know, sort of what is the profile, you know, as we lend? And, uh, you know, we are always, if you're a New Zealand bank, you are going to be in agriculture. So it's really around, you know, what are the type of clients and businesses that we want to be in with. Last slide. Um, I think, you know, uh, what we've seen farmers now have discussions on is really that comment that was made this morning around volume to value. So people will probably ask themselves the question, can we, you know, can we um, achieve more? Uh, so produce less and achieve more. So not just achieve more uh, you know, in terms of physical activity, but achieve more in terms of you know, net tangible equity, uh, achieve more uh, for the welfare of our people or time and family, a uh, you know, number of things. So the first one I put there is is think about this bucket in terms of you know if you have a bucket and there's five holes in a bucket and you want to fill it up you think about how do you plug the bottom hole first. So the first one would be that I would say is mindset of people. So really, there's this concept of you know growth mindset or fixed mindset. Just imagine really that um, we kind of see two kind of people at the moment, and I think this spreads owners uh, and management. And it's really this concept that 50% um, of people are looking at this opportunity at the moment and where we sit and where we're going and feeling like they're going to embrace it and walk towards it and think it's uh, probably one of the most exciting times uh, in their farming history because as these uh, businesses and the industry recalibrates itself, there's going to be huge opportunities and we're already seeing it. The other 50%, and, 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 and I, I call it 50%, but there's probably people that think, this is a bugger. Why is this happening to me? And you know, hopefully, you know, uh, if you look at the young people, um, there's sometimes a sense of entitlement that everybody before them has achieved all this wealth creation, and uh, and uh, it's now not fair. And as we know, you know, your attitude sort of determines you know so much about um, what you do. So very much with the people that we are. You know, if we see that we, we definitely want to be supporting what are people like to be getting in business with desire, their understanding of what their purpose is for being in business, the things they're doing to build their skill sets, uh, you know, build networks, uh, build their knowledge, obtain some cash, have some cash, buy some assets, some productive assets. It leads to equity growth and it leads to choice. And I think generally uh, in this industry, uh, what we're seeing is people are much more conscious about the image. And so the uh, resources that people are now putting into uh, this space is very important. Uh, I, I suspect um, we could still do more as we have to think about how we compete you know, in these industries. Very much I think around people, it's about character and competence. You, know, you tend to find those people that have similar values to you. People that want to strive and we definitely need people that want to continue to innovate. I think as uh, measures in this space, people are looking at much more around um, development of their staff, uh, very much development of um, themselves, their understanding of their business. You know, it seems like uh, our retention. There's a great little fact around retention that if you, uh, each time you turn over staff, it's probably costing you their, their year's salary. System execution. You know, being said already today, what we probably uh, see is that just about no matter what size and scale that you operate your businesses, it's so important around simplicity and repeatability. And uh, I mentioned this the other day, but uh, when I was working for uh, years ago, when we had to do our Lincoln University courses, we had to do a 12 month practical, and I worked on uh, farm meth and green mount uh, Eddie Glass. And uh, you know, he used to say to me, I think about day one, Mark. That is the supply, seasonal supply curve of New Zealand dairy system, and that is the demand of the seasonal cow. And if they match, 
uh, is, is your dairy farming system. Um, and I think uh, that really stuck home to me over time about how your belief systems drive your behaviours and determine your outcomes. And so everything that was designed in that farm was very much around simplicity. If we look at the, the last couple of financial stability, look, there's balance sheet and there's operational performance. Um, I think the key here is know your numbers. You know, have your dashboard. Too often when we're talking to people and businesses, uh, what we hear is one dashboard, so it might be production, so where's profit? And I think that's that's probably the key thing. If you think about uh, so, uh, you know, the definition of the savings, it's probably not spending, so it relates back to those philosophies you have around your business. With a static milk price and, and limited capital gains, you know, one of the things we have to focus very much on is what are those net operating costs and to build out that stability. It's a uh, you know, little story around um, the guy who uh, sold disparates, how did he double his profit? He wrote on the packet, take two. <laughs> so I guess what, what we have really is, you know, thinking about from a bank's perspective, you know, what we are doing is we are getting people to focus on uh, debt repayment, affordability, um, amortisation, why? Well, we all know that these things that are coming us down the track, we don't know exactly when and what and how size they hit, but I guess in, in light of um, without other clear and strategies around investment, etc., paying back down your business is not only great discipline, but provides capacity for yourself to support your own development and investments in the future. So lastly, uh, really around being future ready, we sort of think about this in terms of you know, how are you going to govern your business in the future? What are you going to need in terms of skills to run your business? And, and how are you likely to have to transform your business? So many things now in terms of this space around welfare of people, farms, etc. And ultimately, when you bring this down to the last point in terms of what our point of difference is, uh, Marino New Zealand's got a great story about their attributes. But if you think about what Mike's talked about and you think about what New Zealand can do, it's a collection of those attributes that may give us a point of difference on the international markets. Cheers.